And our purpose here at Canning's Purple is to start and shape conversations that matter. And I think we can all agree that this is one of those conversations that is really occupying the minds at the moment and certainly matters. Uh, today I'm joined by Ruth Callahan. Uh, Ruth is our Chief Innovation Officer and is working with clients uh, across their crisis comms. And uh, I think it's safe to say is a big fan of all things digital and digital tools and digital integrations. Um, so thank you for joining me, Ruth. Thank you, and look how look how carefully we are socially distant. Absolutely. Uh, so first up, some housekeeping. Um, so down to the uh, right hand side of your screen, uh, we encourage you to please uh, contribute some questions, ask us, uh, put us to the test. We'll be uh, very happy to answer any questions about any tools or how to communicate with them. Um, so today we're going through tech in time for lockdown. And I think it's important to mention that a lot of the tools that we're going to be recommending are based on sort of our experience and how, how we've seen them flowing out um, or being rolled out by organisations. And we're really going to be focusing on tools that can be rapidly uh, put out there. Uh, they don't have huge amounts of um, time needed to, to set them all up. And I think that's a really important thing, uh, which we'll get to. Um, so, Ruth, we have, um, you know, We've seen an extraordinary amount of change in business recently. Um, how have we gone with lockdown so far? Look, it's. Um, I think it's really important to remember that a week ago, this would have been a, seemed a really extreme conversation. Mm. Two weeks ago, people would have laughed if you had to suddenly have this conversation. Um, the world is changing every second. Um, one of the reasons why I think this is uh, such an important conversation to be having right now is because businesses are having to make really important strategic decisions with no time to prepare and no time to actually to think them through. So there's a, a, a really big problem around um, the speed of the crisis. Uh, there's a really big issue around the fact that we may suddenly see an enormous isolation for workers. So people who've never had to work regularly from home are going to be sent off to go work remotely for weeks, possibly longer. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty within business leaders about what response they should make, and we don't want business leaders making the wrong choice because that's bad for everybody. There is a significant fear of overinvestment. People don't want to be spending money at this moment, which makes perfect sense. Yep. Um, and there's such a lack of time. There's so little time to organise a proper change process. So what we're talking about today are really lightweight, easy solutions that you should be able to put in, for, to be honest, pretty low cost, um, and they're going to be able to help your people work from home. Yep, exactly. Well, let's dive in. Let's start talking about some of the tools, shall we? So what can we, the first question for you, Ruth, um, what can we, what tools would you recommend to get people starting to collaborate and starting to work together uh, when they are remote or working in different areas? Yeah, now look, this is this is a, a pretty big one. So um, there are a couple of different questions that business leaders need to be thinking about. Um, and we'll talk through, we're not paid by any of these people, we wish we were, but uh, we can talk through some of the, the, the types of questions that we think business leaders should be asking here. Um, the first question is, um, do you, are you looking for teams that you can be collaborating with um, so that you're working and talking at the same time? Are you looking for teams that are going to let you plan a project so that if you normally would work with multiple people in a small group, how are you planning through the various stages of the project and not letting those get missed? Or are you looking for a tool that is really just about communication? You want to be able to see somebody as if you were still in the office. So, those three questions are going to help define the kind of conversation that you that, that you need. The first one there, Glenn, is talking. So a lot of people, huge numbers of people have signed up to Microsoft Teams, but there are also a lot of people on Slack. So what's your preference? So I guess it, it with any of these tools, it depends on your in your, on your context of your organisation. So I think it's really important to work out what sort of communication do you normally use um, and, and try and feed straight into that. So if you're an organisation that is prone to uh, conversations that happen just as you're walking past, then you need to start to replace that with more verbal communication rather than going straight to sort of a text-based communication. So something like a Microsoft Teams, I, I personally, I think it's it's a great program. The thing I like about it the most is its integrations. It seamlessly integrates into things like OneDrive. Uh, you can put smart sheets into it. There's a bot for almost everything, um, including stand-ups at the start of the day. Um, so stand-ups being just a really quick way to get everyone uh, kind of communicating what they're doing for the day. It lets you check in with your team and say, well, what did you do yesterday? What are you planning to do today? What's standing in your way? It's a really good three question way of, of getting that done. And you don't have to all be in the same room for that. You can sign on in the morning and answer those three questions. And then you get a report that says, here's what your team's up to. And it's automated. And we've talked about the fact that there's very little time for every, anyone to adapt to this. So the more you can automate and the more that can just happen without having 
to have someone click a button, make a call, uh, prompt those sort of meetings, the, the better. And we mentioned Slack as yeah. well. So I think it's worth uh, touching on Slack. Um, I've used uh, Slack a lot. Um, I, I go to and fro whether or not I like it, if I'm being honest. Um, but I think what, what Slack allows is that uh, sharing of large files. I think it's really good for that. Uh, Microsoft do it through OneDrive. Slack do it as more of a native thing. Um, there's different price points for them as well. Um, and I think if you're already using Microsoft, Teams is, is going to be the way to go. And look, I suppose there's, there's one thing I'd say about Teams. I, I, we've only started using it in the last week or so. We've managed to get in the entire organisation onto it and deploy it really fast. So that's a big tick. Um, I love the fact that we've replaced email almost in, entirely internally. That's yep. the second big tick. But that doesn't mean that there aren't people who suddenly find that they aren't able to use it. Now, I think that's not necessarily a user error issue, um, although there are some challenges around training. But I think it's also that Microsoft can be problematic. We've all used Word mm -hmm. our entire lives, and we all still swear at Microsoft Word. So you have to accept that there are going to be some challenges sometimes with those. Yep, exactly right. All right. so, so let's maybe look at some of the project management tools. So I think this is a this is the second part of this, and, and most of these would integrate with um with things. So um, if you've got a project which has multiple steps, you might normally have a, a whiteboard where you know that things are checked off, or you might have sticky notes um, saying yes, we've moved this from here to this to there. You might just have a very large spreadsheet in your office as you complete the work, it's gone. None of that works when you're working remotely. So what are the options that you've got? Exactly. So we, we look at something like Asana, for example. So Asana is a program that, um, to be honest, it, you don't. It's not something just for when you work remotely. It's it's worth having as a as a program for any sort of task tracking and things like that as well. Um, it's a it's a great program in terms of the integrations it allows you. Um, again, Asana goes straight into Microsoft Teams. So you you yes, you've got all these different tools and you've got that sense of oh, why do we need this tool and what does this tool do versus this tool. Um, but when you can amalgamate them into something uh, centralised, I think that's when you start. That start is actually another power. tip for Teams, isn't it? That you can bring all your tools together mm. under the tab, so you don't yep. ever leave Teams, which is quite nice. You never have to leave Teams. teams. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so let's let's have a look at another one. Um, so Monday, uh, Monday yeah. is a is another. It's more. It's probably prettier. Would you say? That? Oh, look, I'm a big fan of pretty in tech. Um, but the other thing I like about Monday is that it does have lots of different levels that Asana doesn't quite have yet. So Asana is great for when you have a team, almost like a checklist. Um, I want you to do this blend, this blend, this blend, this blend, and you took it yeah. off and I, I get to hear about it. Monday is really good when you have approvals that are required. So that if I need to have somebody in our team writing something, but I can't go to the client until I've edited it, um, Monday lets me have all of those you know, workflows effectively set up and it moves up the chain and I know I get the notifications only when I need to. Uh, it also lets me put things in in terms of automation again so that I can actually set it up that once this thing here happens, I want this thing here to happen. And that's a real benefit of project software that is, is, is fantastic. One thing about Monday is it maybe it's a little ambitious. It is trying to be everything. So mm. it's got lots of stuff. And you'll hear us mention it a few times through this presentation because it also wants to be your CRM and it also wants to do other things as well. So one to investigate, but perhaps not the fastest one to deploy. Yep. We've just had a question in uh, from Paula, which is what is a stand-up? Stand-up, well, it's, it, look, we'd steal this out of um, the agile working area. So uh, when you have a small team, you used to literally stop for 15 minutes at the beginning of the day and stand up together. And the 15 minutes was designed to expedite the conversation. And it's it's those three questions. What did you do yesterday? What are you doing today? And what's standing in your way of getting those things done? It's really important when you're trying to maximise the workflow. And right now, everyone is trying to maximise the workflow so that you have that clarity. It helps you um, when you have stand-ups electronically. It actually does help you track over time what are the things that are standing in your way. So if it's the same blocker every day, that the blocker is I can't get something out of this, this department or I can't think to get onto this server, that lets you really quickly identify the things that are stopping you being as productive as you'd like to be. Yep, and uh, for those worried that we're completely removing face-to-face, -face, you can always follow that up with a, uh, a virtual call as well. In fact, that's what we do within our team. Um, we do the stand-up to get that uh, kind of content out there and then means that when we do have a face-to-face -face call, we can actually check in with each other and you know make sure we're okay and how's the dog and how's the parents, how's the family, but then also get down to the nuts and bolts of anything that uh, that is going wrong. Fantastic. 
let's take through what, what the next tool that we'd like to go through because as I said, Monday, great tool, really clever. Doesn't work for everybody though. So I think the next one on our list is Airtable. Now, you may never have heard of Airtable. They've kind of flown under the radar, but this is an, an interesting one. It, it's similar to Monday in that it lets you have um, a lot of different steps in there and a lot of pieces of content. But the screen that we've got up here is showing the kinds of templates that they've set up as ready to go for business. So if you are looking for a really simple way of going, here is a problem I've got, I don't actually have my sales pipeline on the, the systems that I'm using now, Airtable will give you the template and you can just literally follow it along. It makes life a lot easier. And they've got templates for marketing, for editorial, for your website, for public relations. There's lots and lots of things. It's like having multiple um, spreadsheets that all interlink. So unlike using Excel where once you have, you might have an Excel for events and something else for their clients, Airtable will bring them all in so that they all talk to each other. Yep, brilliant. I think, you, I think you've covered all of that. I've got nothing else to add to that. Um, and Trello. Ah, uh, yeah. Look, and now we've had long arguments about Trello because I'm a big fan of Trello and you don't like it. No, no. It's, it, I, I just find it's, um, it, 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 it distracts me. Uh, it sort of takes me down the wrong path. I think there's there's other tools. However, maybe you want to say why you why you enjoy it. Look, I, I used Trello when I used to teach at university, so it was the simplest, easiest, cheapest thing I could give to a bunch of students and say, here, collaborate. Mm. Um, it's like uh, to do lists, and you see on the screen, you you know exactly what's going on, and as things get complete, you move the card across. So if you do nothing else and you want to have a really basic, mm. high, you know, really simple, simple thing, Trello. Fantastic. You can use it for your family to plan, you know, who's doing what, whose turn is it to do the housework. You know, it's it's just a really friendly, lightweight mm. product. And that's a good comment around these some of these programs work in boards and some of them work in lists. I'm a list person, you're a, a board, board person. person. Um, it's down to the individual and it's down to the organizational context of which one works better. Um, we're not uh, we're not sitting here saying which one will definitely work better. It's uh, you know just part we of might. Yeah, we might. Yeah. All right, let's uh, let's move on. Okay, this is a list. This is a list. All right, so um, I've thrown in um, Smartsheet here because Smartsheet has a couple of um, really traditional styles of things that, that will appeal to some people, particularly if your business is very much spreadsheet-based. So Smartsheet is like Excel in, in many, many ways, but it's for text rather than the numbers. What it does, though, is have some really nice integrations and automations, and I've put up on the screen an example of some of the, the uh material that it's producing for businesses, including, for example, a, a travel and illness form. So if you've got staff that are traveling at the moment and you're having trouble keeping up with what they're doing or what their, their status is, you might have several offices all at different levels in terms of their pandemic response. Um, I would recommend having a look at the Smartsheet um, free coronavirus uh, material because it's fantastic. It actually lets you um, take some ready-to-go uh, people straight away and apply them. Yep, perfect. All right. So, I um, I want to ask you um, now. I think there's a lot of anxiety and there's a lot of pressure around whether or not if we send everyone out of the office, how do we how do we make sure they don't spend the whole day, you know, on Netflix playing ping pong with their housemate, you know, all these all these things uh, that they would typically do on the weekend. How do we make sure that that staff are productive and actually, you know, working with the same motivation they would if they were in the office? Look, that, again, huge challenge. And it's going to be more of a challenge as we go forward in this because they're going to be, I would expect, some peaks and troughs in, in workflow. Mm. So um, there are a couple of different questions that I'd, I'd pose to a business in this space as well. So um, one of the, the most crucial is mm. are you talking about um, wanting to track how busy people are overall so you can be moving work around? That, that's a pretty standard way of, of applying time tracking software. Um, Alternatively, you might be wanting to track how busy people are moment to moment as effectively evidence of the fact that they are working on what they say they're working or how much time are they spending on YouTube instead yeah. of spending on, on the tasks that you've given them. And so it comes down to a really hard question, which is how much do you actually trust them and how much do you trust that they are reporting back what you need? I think that's a that's a really interesting comment because in you know ideally you trust all your employees, right? Because that's uh, you, you've brought them into the organisation. And for organisations that don't have time tracking as a as a part of everyday practice, and time tracking is to introduce it could be seen as a bit of a big brother effect of why am I now being watched? But really, like you say, it's about um, 
you know, making sure that people are putting their time into productive tasks and that people are busy and yeah. that they yeah. will still have a job, uh, you know, in a couple of months' time. Particularly when you can't oversee the process anymore, you need to have ways of checking the results. And so chance tracking software can actually be part of that. It, it helps smooth those two things on the way through. Let's look at some. Okay. So let's uh, let's start off with, with Harvest. Um, so, so we use Harvest. Uh, yeah. If you want to take us through it. Look, I love Harvest. Um, it's on the list of my pretty tools. Um, one, one thing I like about Harvest is that it has some really fantastic data. So it lets you cl click in your time from wherever you are. You can record your time on your phone. You can record your time on your laptop. You can have it as um, something that you type in. You can have it as a timer. So if you're working on a task, you put the timer on, you put the timer off, and it's, it's easy. Um, it lets you set uh, different elements of that, so you can just just record the time, or you can record it against the cost rate of the person that you're, you're watching. So, it's a really um, simple, colourful, easy to use tool. We deployed it about a year and a half ago, and has been yeah. And I think the the main reason um, we we like it so much is because you know people don't want to have to do their times. It's a it's a mm. it's a thing they have to do. They they don't, they don't want to do it as part of their job. So you want to make it as easy as possible and less intrusive. And the interface of Harvest is quite friendly. Um, it's yeah. simple for the, the employee to put their, their time in and it's complex in the background to, in order to, um, to get data out of it and things like that. So it works well on both ends. One side, the downside of Harvest is it takes a little bit of time to just think about how you want to set it up because mm -hmm. once you've set it up, then you should continue to run it that way. You don't really want to just throw everybody in without having a think about how, what are you actually trying to see over time. Uh, the other thing I would say about Harvest, though, is that it is it is entirely reliant on the employee to saying the truth. So you are, mm -hmm. you know, it's not tracking them; it's recording them, and that's a, a big distinction. Absolutely. Okay, let's look at the uh, the next the next tool. Um, so we've got Toggle. Take us through it. Rick. All right, super super simple. It's it's um, like Trello. It's really lightweight, very very simple. Um, it, they also have a really good free option. So. Uh, if you just want to start getting some really basic information and you don't anticipate that you'll want to have a time tool into the long term, then Toggle's a nice, easy one to throw out. It's it's pretty simple. Um, it's just, again, on off. Yep. Uh, just a reminder as well, if anyone has used these tools, we'd love to hear your feedback on them, um, whether you think they're, they're working for you, and um, please uh, question away. All right. Work plus. Now we're into the series, so work pulse. So, oh, um, work pulse. <laughs> so this is a slightly more um, intrusive version. So if the question here is not, I'd like to know how much people are getting done so I can you know, move their work around, but rather I want proof that they are actually working, then this is where work pulse comes in. Um, it can be deployed onto all your software and all your computers, and it literally will track what the, what the person's doing in terms of their productivity. This can be a really challenging point, but it is something that I know a lot of work, a lot of officers are really requiring because they have to know that the work is actually being done in the way that it's being said it's done. Uh, it, it'll give you that um, ability to say, you know, this is how much time they spent on Microsoft Word. This, this is how long they spent on Outlook. This is how long they spent surfing the web. This is what the websites were that they went to. So. There are some issues around privacy, and you would want to be really cautious about how you roll this out to your team. But if it's something where you're going to be giving everybody a lot of large S at home, it's one to consider. Yep. Okay. I think the the final one in this uh, kind of area, if you want to take us through. Oh this well, this, is, this actually work pulse as well. So that this what what this does though is I'm just going to highlight the fact that you can have the real time monitoring, and it's not always abundantly clear to your employees that it exists. So. Um, look, I think if you can avoid having to uh, upset the apple cart at this moment, you might want to do that. But as a long term, this is something that if you want to be continuing a process where you say to people, we, you know, we want you to work from home, but the condition for that is this, then this is one to look at. Brilliant. So this probably leads us to what kind of work they're going to be doing. Now, uh, we've talked a little bit about the fact that uh, a lot of people are going to have to work digitally, but then they're going to have to engage with customers digitally, and that's much harder. So, Glenn, how are you going to do that? Well, a step back. Let's let's think, how do we normally do it? So everything's changing in the way that we're communicating, but we don't want to just uproot all the, the, you know, the conversations that we're having at the moment. If your main form of conversation with your clients is email, 
starting to call them is going to start to jar that. And if they've never used WhatsApp before and all of a sudden they're getting updates on WhatsApp and they're getting updates on Facebook Messenger and all these things, it's going to come across actually quite negative. Um, so there is an element of consistency uh, in what we need to do. Um, and I think that's, um, that's, that's really important. And it's worth being said, though, that they, you know, there, there does come a time to shift. So the Singaporean government, when they um, were announcing their plans and what they were doing, they used WhatsApp. Uh, that was their main form of communication. They, to my knowledge, they hadn't done that before uh, through WhatsApp. And they used these new technologies and they went to where the people are. So that's really important as well uh, to kind of keep in keep in mind that one-to-one -one channels are very appropriate for this sort of thing. This is a big issue though because if people suddenly get a text on their phone, they can actually it can actually turn them off. I mean, I know that there are some companies I'm quite happy to text me mm -hmm. because I've provided that detail, but there are others that I just don't want them to be texting me at all. That's my my number, and I don't want to have that intrusion. Exactly, and also we should talk about is it sustainable? If you're texting or you're in, you're clients and your customers all the time, you, you can't be doing that forever. There has to be some level of sustainability because we don't know what next week and, um, and uh, the future has. So how are we going to do this? What, what would be your preferred suggestion? All right, well, let's, let's look at some of the tools. So email. Email is so, so important in this, um, in this environment. So we look at things like MailChimp and Campaign Monitor and Autopilot HQ, and I know I'm rattling off some names, but these are all email providers. Um, We're so going to provide these in the slides, right? So we will absolutely provide these, um, but what I want to focus on is MailChimp. So MailChimp is our pick of the bunch, if you like. Um, reason being is that it's, it's cost effective, it's very cost effective. In fact, it's free up to a certain point. Um, it's got a drag and drop editor, so you can build your own uh, you know, white labeled, really well designed um, emails. Uh, you can import lists directly from a CRM, like a HubSpot or something like that. Um, and it just you know, in general is just a, it's a really robust tool. And I know that a lot of people are thinking, well, I've got email, you know, let's just, um, I'll just line CC or I'll send people. If you get one thing from this webinar, don't do that. Uh, never ever line CC or blast emails to people outside your organization. Uh, reason being is that you can get pulled up in spam filters. If you get pulled up in spam filters, everyone in your organization gets pulled up in the same filter. Then your emails start going straight to people's spam. So the one thing we don't want when we're trying to communicate with people in a rapid environment is your emails going into spam filters. Um, so yeah, please don't do that. Um, all right, let's. It's also blind. You're also emailing blind in that case. You have no idea if they've opened it or if they've if they've engaged with it. Absolutely. Yeah, really good point. Um, Mailchimp has really um, advanced tracking as well, so you can see who's opened it, when they've clicked on it, what they've clicked on, how many times they went back and opened the email, whether they forwarded that email onto someone else. Uh, the time that they opened it, you, just, you know, maybe a creepy or scary amount of data, I don't know, it depends how you look at it. I see it as an opportunity to refine what you're doing. Um, if you're sending everyone communications at six o'clock at night and people don't open it to eight o'clock in the morning, maybe that's when you should be sending your email rather than six o'clock at night. So you can sort of refine what you're doing as well. Um, drift, so we've had lots of conversations, Ruth, about chatbots. Uh, we sit on different sides of the fence, uh, different days, whether they're good, whether they're bad. I think the position I have is that they are fantastic if you do them properly. Uh, I think we've all gone onto a website where you just landed on the website and all of a sudden you're getting pinged with buy this, chat here, and those sort of chatbots. Um, but in this context, a chatbot can be a really useful way to immediately say, hey, we're aware of the issues, uh, or our office is closed, or please contact us here, and actually direct that traffic. Um, well, and one of the challenges of chatbots is that normally people say, well, I don't want to talk to a robot, and I can't guarantee that there's somebody around to take that call. Mm -hmm. Well, right now, you're probably in the best position to be able to guarantee that there's someone around to take that call. So if you're already using an instant messaging service, either through um, a, a, a chatbot um, platform or something else, you've got mm -hmm. more people around who'll be able to respond to that when the query is there. And right now, you don't want to be leaving business on the table. So if someone's on your website, you want to know about it, and you want to be able to help them. Exactly, and this is a good example of a tool that you can use whenever, in any environment. It can add value in, in, in lots of different ways, uh, whether that's automating um, to a degree um, yeah, the communication so that the person's, when they do eventually speak to someone, they're speaking to the person that can actually answer their question. Nothing worse than being passed on and passed on and go around in a loop and that person's at lunch and you don't get your answer. So, um, so yeah, chatbots, really important. Um, now, if we move on to webinars, uh, so this is where we are now. Uh, we obviously are, um, are well, um, 
well invested in webinars and see the value in it. Uh, it's something, again, that organisations have been and should have been doing for a long period of time. And this is one of those catalysts. There are really lots of reasons it. why companies would, would choose not to, because mm. they'd probably be worried about the technology and worried yep. about getting it wrong. Sure. But the bar for entry is pretty low now, and you uh, you really need to just try it. Yeah, exactly. It's the, the running off a webinar, the actual technical side of it, is not the hard bit. Uh, the hard bit is getting people there and then following up with those those people and actually providing value post um, and pre-event. Um, and that's 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 quite important. So um, the we use ClickMeeting. Um, we use ClickMeeting for lots of reasons, um, mainly because it's uh, the features and, and what we can actually deliver as a production quality is, is a lot higher than some of the others. Um, I know people have, um, have asked me why we don't use Zoom. I think Zoom is the, uh, well, I know Zoom is probably the most prevalent. Um, but the reason we like click meetings so much, and this is really important for tools, is that the barriers to getting onto it are low in that you don't have to download an app. Um, and as soon as you have to download an app, you're adding a barrier for people. Um, and if you if you add a barrier, um, that's also, it's a personal barrier, like, oh, I don't want to download this onto my phone, I don't have space, those things. But it's also an IT infrastructure issue. A lot of organisations, particularly schools, universities, government, if you're on a work laptop, you can't download apps without approval by a um, uh, by the admin of the um, IT. So we've chosen to use a, a tool that just eliminates those barriers. You know, why put them up when people are already finding that? Um, I'm very that sad though because I understand that Zoom has that filter that makes you look much better on camera. So you know, we, we can we can hope for that. <laughs> but that is a that's a real plus. That some of the some of the things that they're doing with webinars now is designed to make you look much more professional than you might otherwise do. Don't know what you mean. <laughs> All right. So the final thing I wanted to, um, to to touch on is social media. So I think I'm not going to preach around the value of social media and um, and what it does. I think we all know that social media has a place for organisations and communication. Um, but what I did want to touch on, and we've sort of uh, mentioned it, is the, the likes of Facebook Messenger and WhatsApp. Um, it's where people are. It's where they're communicating. And we're already seeing a lot of... Um, data around people are now working from home and they don't have their manager and they don't have their boss and they don't have the social pressures around them that people are using social media more. They're also potentially sitting at home and want that connection. That's how they're communicating with people now. So we've seen real right, um, real spike in social media use. Um, and when there's a spike and people are there, that's where you need to be communicating as well. Um, so it's about setting up your, your tools to be able to, things like uh, Planable or Hootsuite or Sprout, to be able to communicate uh, Across platforms, um, but it's also about uh, putting the protocols in place that there's actually someone, you know, active and responding. Otherwise, it's it's a pointless activity and it could be a negative thing. I think there's going to be a lot of fear about businesses closing and not being seen again. So you mm. want to be visible at this point. You don't want to just disappear out of people's radar. But this does lead us to a really big question, Glenn, and that is, we're talking about communicating with your customers. How do you know who those customers are anyway? Yeah, no, that's that's a, a really good. Um, question. I think it staggers me how um, how many organisations don't know who their customers are. They don't have a list, or they have a sort of email list over here, and it's in their phone or it's in their head. And um, it it's sort of um, it it yeah. It's uh, in times like this, it's a real issue. So we talk about CRMs. Um, so CRMs are your collection of everything from your the organisations you work with, the individuals, how often you've communicated with them. Um, and really, in times like this, you can call upon them to, at, you know, at a glance, get everyone that has been into your building in the last week or every anyone that uh, has sent you an email in the last three months and send them different messaging. Um, it's how we're able to invite uh, most of you today, um, that we were able to pull a list of um, of uh, those we wanted to invite and send out a list and that that could happen uh, without having to kind of get 40 people to send us their email lists. Now look, it's, it's a big concern and most businesses that don't have a CRM are terrified about taking this step because they're enormous, they're mm. really complicated and now is not the time to be trying to roll out something which is really, really big and bulky and is going mm. to require lots of effort within your business. Yep. But that said, there are some things you can do to have lightweight CRM, can't you? Yeah, absolutely. And things like HubSpot, um, that that's a you, entry level for a lot of these CRMs are quite lightweight. Um, so you can set one up, you can have up to X, I think it's 2,000 contacts, things like that, for, for free. Um, and that's your way to start. And that 
touching on your um, on your point, if anyone has set up a CRM in an existing business, they would know how difficult it is. Mm. Um, so now is is the time to to engage in those sort of tasks. I think um, if to really if think you about what yeah, you, if you're really thinking about what you want to do, just use mm. some of this this period to, to to define the question for what you might want in the future. But right now, you could use Mailchimp as a CRM. You can use Monday as a CRM. You can use HubSpot's free CRM. And I would recommend looking at the free side of it, not necessarily getting talked into some of the other elements just yet. Exactly. Um, there's, you know, you may already have Microsoft Dynamics and not be using it as a CRM, mm -hmm. worth exploring. Um, we throw a nimble up on that screen, which is it very much drives out of your email uh, lists. But if nothing else, having something where you've got your a shared understanding of who your customers are, that's really going to be important right now. You don't have to use that data for anything other than being able to define, here's how we would reach them, here's who they look like, and here's how we might go find other customers that also look like that. Yep, exactly right. Uh, is there anything else you want to mention around CRMs? Well, look, the only thing I want to say is that sometimes with CRMs, there come some other nice things. So mm. my, one of my favourite things about HubSpot is actually not the CRM. It's a little tool that you get under the sales add-on, which we've got, and that gives us a reverse IP tracking. So you'll have Google Analytics, which is great, um, and that'll tell you how many people are come to your website, but it won't tell you who they are. So HubSpot has the opportunity of sending me an email every day that says, here are the people that have been on your website in terms of the company names, and here's how many pages they looked at. Now that's fantastic. I think I'm giving away trade secrets here, except for the fact that it's a really useful way for businesses that are relationship driven to understand what's working, what's not, and what people are looking at on your website. Yeah, exactly. And we um, we have a lot of um, a lot of well, over the last sort of two three weeks, we've had a lot of people uh, come and talk to us about how do they keep their their stakeholders engaged. Their if they're a member organisation, how do they keep their members engaged? And um, knowing who is trying to engage with you could be the first step in actually then re-engaging them. So um, yeah, really really important points and. I think it um, takes us on to, as you say, the, we're talking about websites now, and I think we can all, or we should all agree, I hope, uh, that websites play an enormous role in business communication. Um, when you talk about online space, it's the only thing that you have complete control over. You design it, you build it, you write it, you host it, you share it, uh, you determine how it looks and, and, and what's on there. And when so much of what we're doing is moving towards digital, um, and everyone's trying to find out information and they're trying to communicate, your, your website is becoming your receptionist. It's becoming your front door. Um, it's becoming your foyer. It's becoming everything that represents your outward facing business. And I think there's, there's a few things that need to be kind of lined up when we, when we start talking about um, uh, how to negotiate a website in this environment. And um, we'll, we'll take, we'll, let's go through some of them, shall we? Yeah. So your homepage. Um, Homepage is, like I said, it's your front door to your website, which is now the front door to your organisation. And if you don't have something on there that's immediately communicating your your latest news and updates around how you're reacting to, to the environment, um, you, you're going to find that people are going to start getting lost in the details of your website and they won't know where to go. So you'll see this is just an example of, um, of our website. And um, top right, you can see we're not dominating our website with it, we're not plastering it everywhere, but we're making it known that we have communications around COVID-19 and what that means and whether our office is open and things like that as well. Um, so yeah, just I think the message there is just really important to, to make sure you're actually communicating there. And we're not talking about redesigning your website from scratch because again, same as CRM, mm. don't do that right now. No. That would be really, really disastrous. But there are things that you can do with your website that are going to try and get that message through. So tweaking your, your homepage, making sure mm -hmm. that there's a button on the front, that's really important. Um, having though something that you can deploy over the top of your web page if you need to. Yep, exactly. So like a dark web page. Uh, so you land on land on the website. Some it, it's the first thing you see. So it's sort of I guess you could call it a pop up, but it's it's got a bigger purpose than that. We're not trying to get you to sign up to a two six eight, although you should. Um, it's more about um, actually getting communication out there to people that come on. So. If they're coming to our website, maybe they're trying to find more information and we're interrupting that usual journey to give them another message. And, and you would know that um, if you're in a business that's got crisis plans in place anyway, you probably have a dark mm -hmm. website for 
a number of different crises. Just having one that you can deploy if need be for this one is going to be quite important. So having something that you can you can pull up, but it doesn't have to be a negative message. You can equally have a positive landing page that you have dropped in over the top of your page website instead. Yep, exactly. And landing pages don't have to be difficult. Uh, there's there's programs out there like Unbounce or Instapage, which you can create a drag and drop landing page and then kind of connect that to your website, uh, which is not as technical as the, as it you know it may seem. Um, in I mean, in reality, if you've got a well-structured website, in that, so I mean, we use we use WordPress, and the way that we build the sites is that anyone that can log onto a computer should be able to create a page uh, based on the way that it's structured. So, if you've invested the money up front to get a, a good, robust website, you should be able to go in and make these sort of um, changes. If you can't, there's solutions there like an Unbounce or a um, yeah. or an Insta page. Do not necessarily use this opportunity to try and rebuild everything from scratch, but just make some little changes that just get mm. your messaging out there and also collate people into one spot. And one thing we've heard a lot from clients in the last sort of two weeks really is that they're trying to get messages out to uh, their customers, sure, but they might also have very large workforces and having a, if you don't have an intranet or you don't mm. have some other place you're sending them, Using your website as your source of truth and the regular updates, giving them an opportunity to subscribe to any changes that might affect them, again, really important. It's all about push and pull communication right now. So you're, you're pushing your messages out, but you've got to have, when they pull in, somewhere that you can get the right answers. Exactly. Um, we can talk about um, Content Hubs as well. Um, so Content Hub being a dedicated area, like we, like we mentioned, where all your communication and your content can be. Um, you don't want your whole website being taken over by um, by COVID-19 communications. You want some sort of regularity to it as well. Um, so the idea of having a, a designed area of your website like a content hub where you can add thought leadership and add updates and communicate to internal and external stakeholders. An extra category of your news page exactly. or whatever it is. Yeah. But it's something you can lead off. Yeah, exactly right. We don't have to um, reinvent and build a whole new website. Although it should be mentioned that um, if, if that is sort of where you, you know, what you're going for at the moment, websites and digital implementation is the sort of thing that you want to be doing now. You don't need face-to-face -face meetings and you don't need um, structure. It's the sort of um, business opportunity to, to go for now if that, if that is where you're at. Okay. So, Ruth. How are you going to spend your lockdown? Well, look, I think there are going to be a lot of businesses that are in the position of hibernating at this point. They're going to want to make sure that they can keep the lights on mm. and just get enough that they need to do. Some of them are going to be working through the pain though. They're going to be saying, well, we need to we need to keep the revenue rolling in. We need to be working on making sure we don't necessarily book new work, but, but bring we should keep the work that's coming through the door. Um, some of them are going to spend the time working for a recovery and looking at what is it that they're going to need to do on the other side. And some of them are going to have to, as the nature of this beast, think about how they redo their business model. So some of the technology choices you make right now are designed to either get you through this bit, but can also perhaps prepare you for a workforce that may really have embraced digital working by the end mm -hmm. of it. Now, one thing we didn't talk about, and I'm just going to, to add this in now, contingency planning mm -hmm. for everything you do for tech. And the reason why we need to mention that is that on Tuesday last, um, when everybody went home in lockdown in Europe, Microsoft Teams went down for a couple of hours and that caused huge ructions. Mm. So if there's another piece of advice we would give you out of this, it's don't just go with one tool and one form of communication and put all your eggs in one basket. Make sure you know that there are three ways to contact your staff, that there are a couple of ways you're going to contact your customers mm. and you can balance that. But it's really important that as you get ready for a recovery, you have started to put in place some other ways that aren't just face to face and just aren't the, the traditional ways of speaking. Yep, yep, good call. Uh, we've got a couple minutes left and then we're going to get into some uh, questions if there are any coming through. So please uh, continue to submit your questions if there's anything uh, that you'd like to ask uh, Ruth and myself. Um, while we wait for those questions to come through, uh, some final thoughts, Ruth. Look, I mean, I think we've said it a few times lightweight and simple, big, big investment right now. So really making sure that you are not spending a fortune on any of the things you're doing, look for a way that you can, you can put in something that will complement what you've got. Yeah, you've just mentioned don't uh, don't put your, all your eggs in one basket. Take a stacked approach. Yeah, uh, you don't have to do everything through your CRM. You can do some things and then 
plug in best in field tools as well uh, so that you're not over investing your time and your money into one thing. The first thing we do whenever we look at a new tool is look at the integrations. Do mm. they speak to each other? Because that's that's what you need to be stacking. Yep, exactly. Uh, don't over invest. I think we've, yep. we've covered that one as that's well. That's right. Um, but you know, go gently. So mm. your team are going to be a bit overwhelmed depending on the type of team you've got. And let's let's dispel the myth that it's millennials that are the world's most techy people because sometimes they are and sometimes they aren't. Um, sometimes there are older people who are and sometimes they're, they're, they're people that don't ever want to pick up a computer. So yeah. you've got to go to each person at the level that they are and give them the support that you can give them. Um, and I think your final point. About websites. It's the it's the centri central point of how people are going to find you now. So it's just vital that you're... You know that you're getting that right and if you're not getting it right then look at cost effective simple solutions um, but if you are in a space where um, maybe your website just isn't working as you need um, now might be the time where you can start to get that that digital um, competency up as well okay any other questions before we uh, or yeah. comments I should say before we jump into the questions let's jump into questions. okay we've, um, we've covered a few as we've gone through uh, one that I haven't covered off is um, Social media, how secure is it? And I think I, I can I can cover this one. But I think it came up around when we were talking about communications um, and mass communications through social media. So things like WhatsApp is um, has uh, amazing encryption now. That it's actually one of the most secure one to one platforms. Um, Facebook uh, as well. I know there's a lot of um, anxiety around these big uh, tech giants and also what they um, how secure they are and what they're doing with your data and. Um, you know, I'm not going to not going to defend them. I'm not going to take a position either way. But they, you know, they they one to one platforms have been proven to be um, to be encrypted and secure. Uh, my, my inclination would be that if it's confidential material that goes to the nature of your finances or confidential stuff around your clients, don't put them on any kind of platform where it can actually be easily shared or or hacked or somebody could just forget to you know that they've got their Facebook open on their phone and they leave their phone on the bus. So I'd rather that that you use those teams for your conversations, but then if you're sharing files, make sure that they're in something that's going to be a little bit more secure. And mm -hmm. this is where, again, Microsoft, the authentication levels are really good. There you've got to go through those annoying two-factor things, and I tend to think that, that gives you that extra layer of confidence. One other thing would be make sure you're not sharing files over too many platforms. Mm. Contingency is important, but you don't want to be losing them. Exactly, and you don't want uh, issues with version control as well, and you don't want to confuse people. I know we've spoken, prob we've probably covered 50, 60 tools, I think. Um, <laughs> it's that way. Then, yeah. And it, um, I hope it doesn't feel like we've just sort of thrown them all at you, but we've guided you through which ones you can use, which ones you can, you should use for different things. Um, and I think speaking to that point, a lot of these tools do come, there, there is a change management process within using them that has to happen so rapidly now. That being clear on which which files get uploaded where, I think is is really important. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Well, uh, we've um, obviously answered everything because we haven't had any uh, well many questions come through. But if you do have any questions um, that come up as you do start rolling these out in your organisations or for yourselves, um, please do uh, reach out or let us know or, or give us feedback on how it's going as well. We'd love to hear. Um, in the meantime, uh, I'd like to thank you all so much for joining. Um, if you if you haven't seen already, we've got a, a daily newsletter coming out. Um, so that's about sort of taking out the uh, misinformation and trying to give you um, the news as uh, as it comes out to us. Uh, so please sign up to that. We'll follow up with this um, with this podcast with the recording and the slides for those of you that were asking about the slides as well. So on behalf of Ruth and myself and Kane Spurple, we'd like to thank you so much for joining us and uh, speak soon.